Okay, everybody, welcome. Um, I'm really happy that, to see such a, a nice, diverse group, and I'm super excited about our speakers today. Um, a couple housekeeping things. If you need CEUs for this webinar and you weren't able to enter those, your CEU identification number on the registration page, please send me an email. So if you scroll up in the chat, you'll see my email in there. So make sure you do that. Um, next month's webinar, mark your calendar, will be March 14th. It's, uh, the topic is <clears throat> Avoiding and remedi Remedying Abiotic Injury of Trees by Utah State University Extension Specialist Marion Murray. So mark your calendar for March 14th. Okay, so a couple of months back I came across the publication that I just put the link to in the chat um, bar there. And it's a forest service publication. It's, it's called Hidden in Plain Sight, Synthetic Pheromone Misleads Beetles and Protects Trees. So this was particularly interesting to me. We've had a lot of folks um, give feedback and let us know that they're um, really interested in learning more about this topic. So I picked three experts and I'm happy to have them all. I'm happy they all said yes. So um, first we're going to talk to, well, first Rob's actually going to give the talk and then Chris and Steve will be chiming in along the way and at the end to sort of assist with questions and, and other topics. So Chris Fennig serves as the research entomologist and leader of the Invases and threats team at the Pacific Southwest Research Station. Rob Progar is the research entomologist at the USDA Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station in La Grande, Oregon. And recently retired Steve Munson served the Forest Service for 41 years as a forest health protection group leader in the Intermountain region. So I'm really grateful to all three of them. Um, we have a lot of uh, knowledge in the in the meeting room today. So please um, put your questions in the Q&A pod um, at the bottom of your screen. And I'm gonna hand it over to Rob now. Rob, Rob, can you hear us okay? I can hear you, can okay. you hear me? Right. Yep, yeah, we, we can. <laughs> okay, I just switched over to share screen, can you see me? Or see uh, my we, screen anyway. we can see your screen, yeah. Okay. Well, to start things off, my name is Rob Progar. I'm a research entomologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, U.S. Forest Service, Pacific Northwest Research Station. And as Megan mentioned, presenting along with me is Chris Fettig of the U.S. Forest Service, Pacific Southwest Research Station, and Steve Munson, formerly of the U.S. Forest Service Forest Health Protection. And Steve recently retired, much to our chagrin. We are three of many individuals who have been working to develop bourbon oak as a viable tool to manage mountain pine beetles. A little background about bark beetles in general. A bark beetle is one of 220 genera with 6,000 species of beetle in the subfamily Scolotinae. Traditionally, this was considered a distinct family Validity, but is now understood to be a very specialized member of the true weevil family, Cucurionidae. Bark beetles reproduce in the inner bark, that's the living and dead phloem and cambium tissues of trees. Relatively few are economically important. Native bark beetles can be important disturbance agents in forests. Population levels of a number of species oscillate periodically often reaching high densities and causing tree mortality on a landscape level when favorable forest and climate conditions co coincide. Bark beetles regulate certain aspects of primary production, nutrient cycling, ecological succession, and the size, distribution, and abundance of forest trees. The extent of tree mortality resulting from bark beetles may be limited to small, Spatial scales, uh, for example, individual trees or small groups of trees at endemic or transient population levels, or may affect entire landscapes. Most conifers have a well defined resin duct system, which is capable of mobilizing large amounts of oleo resin following wounding. There's an ongoing evolutionary battle between the beetle and the tree. This beetle, uh, obviously lost that fight. Most tree killing bark beetle species have highly evolved chemical communication systems. These systems enable the beetles to concentrate their infestation or attack 
on an individual tree in order to overwhelm the defensive system of that tree. And this is indicative of the pitch tubes on the bulb. Several species carry symbiotic fungi that are inoculated into the tree upon colonization by the beetle. Developing larvae and new adults obtain vital nutrients by feeding on associated fungal structures, uh, but the contribution of these fungi to tree death uh, still remains uncertain. A little about the bark beetle life cycle. Following mating, adults lay eggs in the phloem, which are cells just inside the bark that transport photosynthate within the tree. Larvae excavate feeding tunnels in this tissue and or the outer bark. Tree death occurs by girdling of the phloem by colonizing adults and developing larvae. Today we're gonna to talk about the mountain pine beetle. Mountain pine beetle is considered the most powerful insect in North America. It's distributed throughout British Columbia, Alberta, most of the Western United States and Northern Mexico. Its primary hosts are pines, most notably lodgepole, ponderosa, sugar, white bark, limber, and Western white pine. The geographic distribution generally reflects the range of its primary hosts, although that range of lodgepole extends further to the north, whereas ponderosa extends further to the south than where mountain pine beetle populations currently exist. The first significant outbreak was recorded in the Black Hills of South Dakota in 1895 and portrayed by a newspaper in Deadwood, South Dakota as after ruining a billion and a half feet of the choicest lumber in the Black Hills and ravaging thousands of acres of the finest pine trees in the West, the little bark beetle has robbed Uncle Sam's forestry division of $10 million in the last 10 years. Recent mountain pine beetle outbreaks have been severe, long lasting and well documented. More than 27 million hectares affected this is equivalent to the 11 smallest U.S. states combined. Today, about 7% of the United States forests are classified at risk. And this is defined as more than 25% of stand density will die in the next 15 years to insect and disease outbreak. Mountain pine beetle is ranked most damaging of insects considered contributing to this risk. This is a map <clears throat> that shows uh, the impact of the recent outbreak from 2001 to 2011 in red, overlaid on the um, distribution of the primary hosts, which are in green. It's thought there are two general requirements necessary for mountain pine beetle outbreaks to develop. First, there must be several years of favorable weather including summer heat accumulations and winter temperatures conducive to beetle survival. And second, there must be an abundance of suitable hosts. At the start of an outbreak, large trees are targeted by pioneering female. Then adjacent trees are quickly and heavily colonized, often resulting in tree mortality over large areas. The dominant theory proposes that pioneers use a combination of random landings and visual orientation, followed by a direct assessment based on olfactory and gustatory cues, smell, and taste. The killing of trees in groups is a fundamental characteristic of mountain pine beetle infestation. The process of switching from heavily colonized to adjacent trees continues as long as sufficient numbers of beetles continue to arrive, and as long as acceptable hosts are available. This results in a chain reaction that expands the infested area for the duration of an outbreak. Two 
To initiate an infestation or attack, females produce transverbinol and cisverbinol, which in combination with the host monoterpenes, alpha pinene and myrosine, are highly inviting. Exo Revacomin, produced by both sexes, and frontalin, produced by males, further enhance attraction. These attractant compounds are also manufactured commercially and used in the trapping and detection of beetles. A little bit about verbenone. Verbenone is the principal anti-aggregant of mountain pine beetle and several other bark beetles. It's produced in small amounts by the auto-oxidation of the monoterpene alpha-pinene, but primarily through metabolic conversion by bark beetles in, of inhaled and ingested alpha-pinene, the cis and transverbinol, which are then metabolized by yeast in the alimentary system and beetle galleries to verbenone. During the later stages of colonization of an individual tree, the increasing release of verbenone inhibits additional mountain pine beetles from infesting the target tree. This limits the number of infesting beetles to a density that increases the likelihood of brood survival. Although today we're going to talk primarily about one option to manage mountain pine beetle, uh, there are other options available. Verbenone is considered an indicator of declining host tissue quality to the beetle, and its quantity is a function of the extent of microbial degradation, which is reflected by the extent of infestation. Verbenone communicates the message. This tree is not suitable for colonization. Seek another host. Newly arriving beetles then reorient to adjacent trees where the cycle of colonization is defeated. Let's talk briefly about some options to control mountain pine beetles from other options. Chris and Jay seek to set some of these methods in this book chapter. All too often when these outbreaks occur, there's little time to develop a response. Some alternatives are a quick fix. Others involving stand management tactics are longer term solutions. Direct control is more the quick fix. Short term tactics designed to address current infestations by manipulating beetle populations. And this includes the use of fire, insecticide, Chemicals that's both attractants and inhibitors, sanitation harvest, or a combination of these treatments. In the indirect control is designed to reduce the probability and severity of future infestations by manipulate, manipulating stand, forest, and or landscape conditions by reducing the number of susceptible hosts through thinning prescribed burning and or alterations of age classes and species composition. Examples of three insecticidal products to manage mountain pine beetle. Carbaryl on the left, bifenthrin in the center, and permethrin on the right. Insecticides are the least expensive methods to control mountain pine beetle. And the toxicity varies as well as the duration um, in terms of how long the uh, material lasts on the tree. Tree injection, also known as trunk or stem injection, is a method of target precise application of pesticides into the xylem vascular system of the tissue of a tree with the purpose of protecting the tree from pests. This method largely relies on harnessing the vascular, tree's vascular system to translocate and distribute, distribute the active compounds into the wood, canopy, 
and roots where protection is needed. Um, triage on the left is use restricted in turn, and that means it must be applied by a licensed pesticide applicator. Uh, the triage G4 on the right um, is not use restricted and can be purchased off the shelf. Prices are comparable. Let's turn back the time to the year 2000. The mountain pine beetle outbreak that occurred across Western North America over the past 15 or so years was just beginning. I started working for the US Forest Service as an entomologist with Forest Health Protection. And these folks are known as the expert forest insect and disease personnel with regional offices located throughout the West. Populations of mountain pine beetle were rapidly expanding in the Salt Tooth National Recreation Area, the SNRA, and elsewhere in central Idaho. At that time, the only way to assure tree protection was to spray the tree bowl with an insecticide, and this was usually carborel. To ensure treatment success, the tree required 100% insecticide coverage from the base upwards on the tree bowl to a point where the bowl diameter was four inches. As I noted earlier, carbaryl sprays usually last for two years. Administrative areas adjacent to lakes, streams, and rivers were special special concern because they cannot be treated with an insecticide. Forest Service leadership at the Sawtooth National Recreation Area requested forest health protection assistance to protect these areas of high public use. At this time, mountain pine beetle populations were high, aggressive, and it was unlikely that a susceptible, unprotected tree would survive. We established a small study using verbenone in campgrounds, around cabins and picnic areas, and all areas were adjacent to open water um, where we couldn't spray to determine treatment efficacy. In June 2000, 16 plots were located in and around campgrounds and adjacent visitor facilities along the shoreline of Little Redfish and Redfish Lakes in the Tall Sawtooth National Rec recreation area. And these were within mature stand, mature live lodge pole pine stand. Half were treated with verbenone pouches and half were untreated. <clears throat> verbenone was not registered for mountain pine beetle at this time. We proceeded with this project at the request of the National Forest to evaluate verbenone under a categorical exclusion. A little bit about verbenone history. Early experiments testing verbenone in lodgepole pine indicate that there was significantly less tree mortality on verbenone treated plots than untreated plots, and an observed trend of reducing tree mortality with increasing verbenone dose. However, subsequent studies yielded inconsistent or ambiguous results. And these results were over time, geographical area, outbreak intensity, dose, or tree speed, with other studies indicating verbenone is ineffective for re reducing levels of tree mortality in ponderosa pine. Five gram pouch was first registered by the US EPA in 1999 for, of all things, southern pine beetle. Some of the beliefs or dogma surrounding verbenone. I was generally accepted consensus among entomologists in the West was that verbenone treatments were ineffective or at best inconsistent. All studies were conducted for a single year. The general
general premise was that after one season, the number of surviving trees between treatments was unequal. And a new study plot locations were required for subsequent tests. It was obvious a multiple year test of verbenone results over the same study area was required to determine, to determine long-term treatment efficacy. So what did we find in our study? <clears throat> First year, one-fifth of mortality on treated versus untreated plots. Looking pretty good. In the second year, less than half the beetle caused mortality on treated plots is untreated plots. Urban is still looking pretty good. The third year, mortality on treated plots surpassed mortality on untreated plots. In the fourth year, there was four times the mortality on treated plots than we found on the untreated plot. And in the fifth year, there was comparable mortality between both treatments. <clears throat> At the end of the mountain pine beetle outbreak, there was approximately 20% less overall tree mortality on the bourbon untreated plots than on the untreated plots. Separating mortality by tree diameter indicates a strong preference by mountain pine beetle for larger trees. Indeed, many of the larger trees were, were killed off very early in the study. Larger trees have thick phloem that affords offspring a higher reproductive potential and a higher probability of survival. Factors shown to influence overall reproductive success. The next, we set up a new study. We wanted to test verbenone over a larger geographic area. And at this time, there was a change in the formulation of verbenone. Well, maybe not too much a change in the formulation is there was a change in the quantity of verbenone put in an individual pouch releaser. The first study we tested uh, was comprised of a five gram um, Verbenone pouch, which was the standard releaser at the time. The next two studies all involve a seven gram pouch because um, there was some concern that possibly the verbenone didn't last for uh, the entire flight period or the entire uh, beetle flight season. <clears throat> so, in this study, we're hoping to test different population levels and different levels of bark beetle pressure to access the conditions where verbenone would be most effective. So at Heber, Utah, mortality in untreated plots reached 50%, whereas treated plots incurred approximately 15% mortality. Stanley Lake, mountain pine beetle caused mortality also near 50%, with mortality on verbenone treated plots of almost 30%. At Redfish Lake, mortality, 90% of the trees were killed on untreated plots and 60% on treated plots. Untreated plots at Alpine, Wyoming sustained 20% mortality, whereas treated plots only 5%. However, at one of the treated plots, the verbenone pouches were taken, uh, causing that plot to incur significant mortality. At Bel Air Lakes, Colorado, 60% of the trees were killed on untreated plots and nearly 40% on our treated plots. There's an increasing trend, or there is a trend of increasing verbenone failure uh, with increasing beetle cause mortality or increasing beetle pressure. So 
looking at things, looking at the mortality by di tree diameter at Heber, Bourbonon reduced small, medium, and large tree mortality by 15, 31, and 54 percent, respectively. However, at Bel Air, Bel Air Lake and Redfish Lake, uh, where beetle pressure was incredibly high, um, Bourbonon didn't consistently protect any size lodgepole pine tree, any size lodgepole pine tree. Each of those sites had rapidly growing and higher beetle population density. Under these conditions, the application of synthetic bourbonone is less effective. So <clears throat> let's take a minute and think about what might be occurring. In the early stages of an outbreak, trees having thicker phloem are infested. Larger trees having thicker phloem are infested. The beetle population emerging from these trees is significant, and the individuals are more healthy and vigorous. As the outbreak forget, progresses, the abundance of preferred or suitable hosts declines in untreated areas. Untreated areas are the rest of the forest. Think about it. Bourbon untreated plots become islands of desirable hosts in the midst of a vast area of susceptible trees killed by mountain pine beetles. The preference for large diameter trees or perhaps the need for reproduction may be greater adaptive significance than the avoidance of potential interspecific inter competition, which would likely be sig uh, signaled by synthetic bourbon. There are several pouch and several flake formulations in terms of other formulations of bourbon, and although the flake formulation is not as effective as the pouch and require more effort to apply, and uh, <clears throat> it's somewhat more expensive. So again, all the cost calculations are based on individual trees. And we can pause and take a few questions here uh, if there are any. Okay. Just a reminder to folks, um, there's a Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen. Um, it's useful for people to just put their questions in there and Chris and um, Steve and I are all sort of monitoring that. So if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in there as they come up and we'll address them as we go. I'm not seeing any questions, so you could probably proceed as you wish. Okay. <clears throat> so, the latest and newest formulation for bourbon. Let me interrupt you. Through. Sorry, we just had one question pop up. So, Jessica okay. Hartshorn asked, in these stands, would a combo of ver verbenone and insecticide be desirable? Did you did you hear that, Rob? I heard that, but uh, we normally go with the verbenone in places where, it, uh, in these trials, where we could not apply an insecticide. If you apply insecticide properly, you guarantee that that tree will not be infested. Um, some of the other strategies might be uh, perhaps tree removal of the more susceptible trees and then bourbonone application uh, along with that to reduce the appeal of the stand to the mountain pine beetle. But um, we haven't tried a combination of verbenone and insecticide. There were, there have been um, uh, like a push-pull technology where you push the beetles out of one area and possibly into 
a tree, an insecticide treated area, which would uh, remove the beetles from the system, because uh, verbenone basically manipulates the population. It pushes them away. Um, it tells them uh, this area isn't suitable for infestation. It doesn't remove the beetles from the ecosystem. So if you could push them towards a treated area, an insecticide treated area, then perhaps when they try to uh, infest those trees, the insecticide treated trees, it would kill them and remove them from the system. Hey Chris, if you wanna chime in and, and administer any of these questions, feel free, or if you're, you're clearly more qualified than me to help facilitate some of that, so. Sure, Rob, related to Jessica's question, do you want to talk a little bit about combining the use of something like verbenone with sanitation harvest? Um, in terms of removing the susceptible trees, then the verbenone would uh, just make the stand less desirable. Is that what you're thinking? I'm talking in reference to moving, uh, removing currently infested trees before those beetles have an opportunity. Oh, to I see what you're trees. saying. Yes, yeah, that's oh, another common practice is, is when you do get infested infestation within a treated stand, removing the beetle infested trees the next spring before flight occurs or in the fall before um, winter arrives, uh, also removes the beetles from the uh, um, from the system. We also have a couple questions coming in right now, Rob, but one we can probably address quite easily here in reference to using trap out. What's the efficacy concerning the use of trap out for managing mountain pine beetle populations? I haven't tried that. Have you tried that, Chris? No, but generally in the, in the literature, there has been some work done and it's, it's really not been efficacious. This question's coming in um, in reference to some of the work they're doing with Ipsotyphographus over in Europe where trap out or mass trapping of individuals seems to be more effective, much more effective than perhaps in our system. Oh, you mean with not with trap trees, but with funnel traps? Yeah, in, in, in that context, they are using both, but, but primarily I think this question is in, in reference to funnel traps. No, oh, okay. Do you think it's good to move on then, Chris? Yeah, I was going to say, let's move on. There's a good question here from Peter, but I think that probably will be best addressed at the end of Rob's presentation. Sounds good. Okay, moving on. The new formulation referred to as BLAC. It's an acronym for Specialized Pheromone Lure Application Technology. Splat is simply a matrix carrier, carrier of the pheromone. It has the consistency of toothpaste. The technology is used in a number of agricultural products. It was first registered on Mountain Pine Beetle in 2013, and the first operational use was in 2014. So why Splat? The matrix is biologically inert. It's registered for organic production. It biodegrades in one or two years, so it doesn't need to be retrieved after being deployed like the pouch does. The very first SPLAT study, we began testing the material in 2011, and that was where we had an insecticide study in place. We used the controls for the insecticide test as controls for the first flat study. We treated 21 trees, 15 with 32 grams active ingredient 
and six with 40 approximately 40 grams active ingredient, which is much higher than the normal operational application. We pushed this study. It was later in the beetle flight than normal, and at that time, uh, this formulation was just developed. We didn't actually know what the percent active ingredient was at the time of the application. This is a are some photos of the of the first early application of Splat. Um, it was incredibly cumbersome. You couldn't get very far from a road. Uh, everything was carried on a gator, or a, which is a large uh, all-terrain vehicle. However, the results, both doses at both rates. Um, virtually had 100% efficacy in preventing colonization by mountain pine beetle, and nor were there any trees killed. Whereas all the untreated controls were infested, and 93% were killed by uh, mountain pine beetle. Prototype two. Another study, we've used 30 lodgepole pine, were treated with flat verb at seven grams of AI, applied as four 17 and a half gram dollops to the tree bowl at each cardinal direction with a caulking gun. Much easier way to apply the material. And we had 30, uh, untreated controls. All these trees were also uh, had a bait to increase attraction. <clears throat> Even though there was five times less bourbon and active ingredient in the pheromone treatment, we received the same results as prototype one. No trees were colonized and no trees were killed. 100% of the trees were infested and 93% were killed in the untreated control. We also, as part of this project, we looked at one tenth acre circular plots around the treated tree. This slide shows that when you apply splat verb to a tree, the pheromone halo is effective to 11 meters. In the untreated tree, 24% of the trees within 11 meters were infested and killed, whereas something like 1% were infested and killed in the splat verb treated uh, tree. We then looked at small scale fan protection on one acre plots. In this study, we compared splat treated one acre plots to untreated plots to plots treated with the bourbonone pouch. It was this prototype of splat verb became what we know as splat verb today. This slide shows that although splat and pouch were comparable, the pouch was not significantly different from the untreated check, whereas splat was significantly different from the untreated check. Splat verb is at least effective as the pouch. So what we're looking at here is we wanted to look at how well flat verb releases across the season of beetle flight. So we have the release rates is 14.7% uh, uh, milligrams a day for 
days 10 to 30 and it's at, and continues at this rate, the reservoir of verbenone in splat is sufficient to cover most of the flight period, most of the flight period or the period of flight activity. Uh, the cost of splat is about $12 a tree. Our current study is in white bark pine. <clears throat> Why white bark? It's a highly valuable species, often referred to as a keystone species in subalpine ecosystems. Currently, and previously, and currently, entire communities of white bark pine are disappearing. Due to mountain pine beetle outbreaks, white pine blister rust infection, in competition with other tree species. To that end, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has determined that white bark pine warrants protection under the Endangered Species Act. We established individual tree trials in Montana with treatments comprising untreated controls. <clears throat> A two pouch per tree treatment, a five gram splat, a seven gram splat, and a 14 gram splat application. There were 30 replicates of each treatment, and each tree was baited. Results of the individual tree study show that, well, the control achieved 90% mass attacks. <clears throat> And all the verbenone treatments, um, even though there were some partial attacks in the pouch, in the five gram splat, uh, all the verbenone treatments survived. <clears throat> we also did area treatments of six one acre plots, comparing, un comparing untreated control plots with plots treated with the pouch and splat. And uh, <coughs> area treatments for white bark pine, uh, we had very few attacks or infested trees in the controls and in the treated areas. Um, our results are less conclusive due to the low infestation, but um, there are still some treatment differences to be found, and we have uh, one more year of, of treatments to uh, continue this test. We currently apply splat at four 17 and a half gram dollops. Okay, and they're applied. Uh, usually at chest height or higher, sometimes as high as you can reach, at each of the cardinal directions. <clears throat> A more efficient application may be 12 smaller dollops evenly distributed along the bowl. Um, covering the bowl with an even distri distribution of dollops, uh, releasing pheromone plumes, and we're currently testing release rates of various size dollops to see if we can um how well they let's see the diffusion from the diffusion of verbenone from smaller dollops uh can can endure across the season of beetle flight so other ongoing research um we're doing dose studies, which indicate lower rates will provide suitable levels of tree protection, and we're doing this in Montana. Uh, we're testing a splat verb plus for western pine beetle, and we're doing individual tree and area tests of splat uh, for disrupting southern pine beetle spot growth in the southern United States. And that's what we have for today. Any further questions? <clears throat> hey, Rob, it's Chris. We have a good question here from Gail Durham, and she's asking where can we get splat, and it is, is it a controlled substance? No, splat is a general use uh, 
pesticide, technically a biopesticide. So you do not need a specific license to purchase it. Um, I believe there are several places that you can actually get it. It is produced and manufactured by ISCA Technologies, Inc. out of Riverside, California. I'll also put that in here as a, as a text as well. Thanks, Chris. Let me interrupt you for just a quick second. Um, Mark's going to put up our survey questions. We have a couple of quick poll questions at the end. If you wouldn't mind just staying engaged uh, while we address some of these questions, but um, if you wouldn't mind, if you have cute questions for our speakers, put them in the Q&A pod, and we still have a good amount of time for Q&A, but before you tune out, please uh, take our quick poll, and you can move those windows around as much as you want so they don't have to stay right in the middle of the screen when, when you get up, when they come up. So, thank you. Hey, uh, just a couple things. Uh, one of the things I saw in the question and answer session is that uh, Brighton Steed is one of our entomologists in Missoula. I put in there that, you know, in addition to the use of verbenone in our recreation sites, sanitation measures are also on the slide where we don't get the conflicting influence of an attractant pheromone and infested trees along with the anti aggregation pheromone. So that enhances the verbenone when we remove, remove the attractant source from those campsites, uh, campgrounds. So that was a good, uh, good catch, right? But, uh, so we do these verbenone treatments in combination with sanitation. Um, the only question regarding carbaryl and verbenone, you know, if at this point, you know, even with splat, if we had an intense population, um, population densities were significant, and by that, I mean landscape level, tree mortality, surrounding a site that you're trying to protect, I'd probably go with an insecticide. I think, uh, you know, there's plenty of information in the literature that carbol is effective, particularly for logical time for a few years. Um, however, as populations are declining, you know, I feel very comfortable recommending the use of urban you know, to protect individual trees or even areas. But, um, you know, we haven't, you know, to my knowledge, at least with Splat, Chris, uh, and Rob, tried verbenone in, in a Splat formulation in an area where we've had intense beetle pressure. Uh, certainly not like anything we've observed in some of our sites where we use compost. Um, we do have a question here from Glenn. Is Splat available in Canada? Glenn, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if Steve or, or Rob does. If you add your email address, I'll find out the answer to that question and, and email you a suitable response. But I don't know if it's yet registered in Canada. My guess is that it is not, but I'm not sure. Another question here from Scott. Does RH, relative humidity, affect Splat? Um, does desiccation affect viability or longevity? Yes, Scott, um, obviously abiotic conditions influence the release of the active ingredient verbenone from that splat matrix. Um, relative humidity, obviously we therefore have an effect. We just really don't know at what level. Thus far, we really only strongly understand the release rate properties from that 17 and a half gram dollop that Rob referenced earlier. And, and just to put that into perspective, that's kind of a round dollop, about uh, five centimeters in diameter and, and an inch or, or uh, I mean, a centimeter or centimeter and a half in terms of thickness. And that release is somewhere on average about 15 milligrams per 24 hours. But relative humidity would have an effect, but we don't know as to how severe that effect might be. Question here also from Becky. Can you put an old splat dollop on top of a new splat dollop. Um, I have not tried that, Steve or, or Rob or? I haven't seen that either because usually the dollops decompose within a year or two. Um, usually we've, what, we've been putting them above or below or to the side. Yeah, I don't think I would do that, Becky. Um, you know, for those of you that have been using splat formulations, that sometimes you notice that some of the splat has fallen prematurely from the tree bowl. Um, I think that would only compound it if you were to add a new splat on top of old splat. I would not do that. Okay. 
Okay, that email came in. In reference to that discussion, uh, Becky is saying here that they they do it every year on plus trees, um, white bark pine trees that are resistant to blister rust, and they're running out of room to to <laughs> to put. <laughs> There's a question here from uh, Jessica, and I'm I'm by no means an expert in this area of research, but uh, she's talking about these southern pine beetle outbreaks that are now existing in New York and New Jersey, and and also now in Massachusetts as well, and, and wondering if there's any SPB research do, being done in those locations. Yes, there are. There are a group of researchers that are heavily involved in research now, particularly on Long Island. I and, and several others from our agency have been in discussions with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation concerning those infestations, which primarily are occurring in, in pitch pine. Um, and southern pine beetle in general in that area is exhibiting some different life history characteristics than it does, for example, in the southeast, where the primary focus has been on work in loblolly pine. We still have a few minutes left for questions. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A um, section, or if any of you uh, presenters have anything else you'd like to address further, feel free. One thing we can do real quickly is go back, uh, Rob, and further address Peter's question. I don't think you've had the opportunity to see that, but it really focuses on if there's any, being res any uh, research being done looking at combining verbenone with other chemicals for tree protection. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I'll say that again, Chris. I was looking at the Q&A. Um, Peter's question focuses on what other research might be ongoing combining verbenone with, with other chemicals, with other um, chemicals for tree protection. I don't know of any other research that's comparing or testing verbenone in conjunction with other uh, chemicals like insecticides. Um, are you aware of any, Steve? I am not. One thing I did mention to Peter here, Rob, is that the body of research looking at combining something like verbenone with other chemical signals like non-host volatiles to kind of mask the chemical apparency of hosts. Is that what he was looking for, or was he looking for other chemicals like uh, insecticides or yeah, attractants? Wasn't wasn't quite clear. One of the things he was asking is. Um, any compounds being used that reduce the reproductive capacity of, of the mountain pine beetle? Huh. Yeah, uh, we did. We did just get another question come in from Brighton Steed, and she's asking if we should mention the importance of the shape of the dollop. So, not only do abiotic you know, uh, weather conditions influence the release rate of the active ingredient from the splat verb dollop, but obviously the shape influences the surface area, which influences release rates as well. And so again, in the literature, the only thing we've been able to publish on to date is the release rate properties at 17 and a half gram dollop. We have been looking at several other size dollops, several other uh, different shapes of dollops, and we're currently finishing up the chemical analyses of those. So we, able, we should be able to have that information um, out to the public sometime at the end of this year. But shape does also influence release rate. Out of curiosity, what shapes have you tried? I mean, I, I would have never thought shape would have influenced those things, but. Yeah, shape is simply an artifact of surface area. So the, the two shapes that we're really looking at are, are kind of that circular pattern, what we call that dollop. Um, versus just individual individual lines of splat verb applied to the tree. And it, and it lasts a year, correct? Well, it, it really depends, again, on the environment. Um, when we've done the calculations, we believe that splat verb 
has a that 17 and a half gram dollop has enough reservoir of verbenone to last a 103 day period, which is sufficient to cover most of the flight activity period of the mountain pine beetle. It's another question in there, Chris. I don't know if you see it. Yeah, so there's a uh, Okay, uh, from Scott Golden here, any issues with the public messing with the stuff at recreation sites? Steve, you want to address <laughs> that and also your experience with the pouch and recreation sites? Yeah, um, we have not had that uh, problem, Scott. Um, actually, we've had more problems with bourbon on pouch by the trees because they're so visible. Uh, one thing about this flat formulation, you know, it's gray in color and it often blends into the bark. Um, but we have not had that, to my knowledge, where we've had uh, splash removed as a result of somebody uh, prying it off the tree. Yeah, related to that, one of the questions we have had in recent history is can we change the color of the splat matrix? to make it more cryptic on certain colors of bark. So for example, perhaps more cryptic on white bark pine because we may then be using it more frequently in, um, for, for example, in wilderness areas. And so that's something that, that ISCA has been looking at. The color of the dollop can easily be changed without influencing efficacy. Two here that I'll follow up with by email. But there, are, let's see. I think we're we don't have. I don't see any more questions. If anybody else has any? Please answer or ask them now. We have about two more minutes left. The only thing that I'd like to add, uh, Megan, is you know where we've applied flat verb formulation. You know, we've had some difficulty on really steep ground, like at Jackson Hole Ski Resort, for instance. Um, it's much easier to apply pouches in those cases than it is flat bird, because we're applying uh, four dollops on each aspect. So you're you're trying to encircle the tree, and on a steep slope, that's pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, in those cases, we've been just um, relying on our uh, pouch formulations. Um, David had a question. In public areas, are you putting the splat high to avoid disturbances? How high does it get applied to the tree? Well, as high as we can reach. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know. There was some problems early on with the, with the pouches, and we developed a thing called a hundle hammer, which is a hammer head on a lot, long pipe, which would hold the nail, and you could apply the pouch. Um, higher than anybody could reach. But then I'd always present it to that approval. Cool. Well, I sure appreciate all of our speakers um, presenting today on this important topic. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Rob. I, um, we have had a lot of great information in the last hour. I just want to remind folks that this webinar was recorded and it will be on our YouTube um, channel. It will also be on the eExtension website. So keep your eyes out for that if you'd like to share the YouTube link. Um, we highly encourage it. So um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. Um, and mark your calendars for March 14th, which is our next webinar by Marion Murray. And it is, um, the topic will be avoiding damage to trees. Um, what else, one other thing, please take the survey that um, popped up on the screen very quickly. It helps us evaluate how we're doing um, as a webinar series. So thanks Chris, thanks Steve, thanks Rob, thanks Mark. Have everybody have a great day. Thanks, Thank everybody. you, Megan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.